Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Uh, I was uh, with a dear friend of mine, and uh, really that was about the only thing that he said that day. Uh, that had anything to do with uh, what, what's happening across our world. And he just opened up and he just said, Romans 8, 28. And that was everything he said. And uh, I knew immediately uh, what he was talking about and did not disagree with it at all. But the, the last three weeks, that's all that's really rolled over in my head. Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. And uh, so... I got to looking, though, at Romans 8, and there are all kinds of messages of hope that's found in that chapter, not just in verse 28, but all in that chapter. So what I'd love for you to do maybe today in your home is uh, when you get your family together, read over the whole chapter and just underline and highlight and record how many messages of hope that you can spot and find in that one chapter. In 1997, uh, one of the most unusual things that uh, has ever happened in my lifetime that I've been able to read about and see on the news, uh, uh, there was a guy, uh, a British yachtsman by the name of Tony Bollinger. Uh, he was on his yacht in the Antarctica and his boat split in two and sank to the bottom about 100 feet deep in the water. Rescuers came and searched and searched and searched. And then on about the fifth day of their search, the divers found the hull of that ship uh, underneath the water, and they heard tapping coming in uh, from, the out, uh, from the inside of that boat. And uh, after five days of being submerged in Antarctica water, Tom Bollinger swam to safety, frostbitten, uh, but alive. Uh, they were asking him later, Tom, what in the world, uh, being in total darkness like that, what, uh, what happened that gave you hope uh, that you would ever um, be rescued? He said two things. He said prayer and chocolate. Uh, I think that's pretty good. So, while we are going through this uh, pandemic and uh, seeing what's happening across and going through this fluid time in our whole culture, maybe you ought to get you some chocolate to accompany your prayer time. Uh, I believe it'd be helpful. You know, we can do without a lot of things in this life. Uh, somebody said that uh, you can do without food between four and six weeks. You can do without water eh, maybe three or four days. Uh, you can't do without air, but about seven minutes before there is irreversible brain damage done. Uh, can't do without hope a millisecond. We all need hope. Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says that uh, when there was a time we were once without Christ, without hope, but uh, now... We have Christ and we are in Christ and Christ is in us and Christ is uh, our hope. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna give you a few reasons this morning why you and I as believers uh, have hope in our life. And so if you have your Bible or a, an electronic version somewhere along the way, uh, turn to Romans chapter eight with me and, and let's just look for a few minutes at these reasons for uh, the hope that we have. You, you know, listen to me very carefully. God's people ought to be the most hopeful people in the world. Why should we be hopeful? All right, here we go. Number one, you ready? Shake your head like that, okay? I can't see you shaking your head, but I know you are. All right, here we go. Number one, God's pardon erases all of our shame. God's pardon erases our shame. You know that there are no perfect people. God knows that I'm not perfect. I make mistakes uh, every day of my life. We have all blown it. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Now, when we do make those mistakes, when we do sin, uh, shame is a direct result of that. And then that shame can get so overpowering, it causes us to feel worthless about ourselves. It causes us to be depressed and undeserving of anything good that may come uh, our way. Uh, you, you understand, when we're born into this life, uh, we're not born uh, for us to violate our conscience. But then when we do violate our conscience, our conscience then speaks loudly to us. You're not going to get away with this. When we mess up, when we blow it, our conscience says, you're going to pay for what you have done somehow. And so this causes us uh, in the midst of maybe some powerful relationships that shame overpowers us to the point that we will sabotage relationships and then we're not happy uh, when we come to the place that we are successful because we don't think that we're deserving of it and so we'll even sabotage uh, the successes uh, of our life because we don't deserve it. Let me ask all of you a question this morning. What are you ashamed of? If you could list a few things, what would you say you would be ashamed of? Are you ashamed of the way that you treated somebody along the way? Or maybe you're ashamed of the way somebody treated you, even though you know that it was not your fault. What they did to you, you feel like somehow you deserved it or you caused it, and you have shame because somebody along the way absolutely wronged you. Can I just say a word to all of you here? that are watching today, God does not want you to feel that way. That's not God's purpose and plan in uh, your life, that someone did something to you. Uh, either way, you feel like that you are hopeless or something that you are helpless and maybe somehow deserved it. God says something to us in Romans 8 verse 1. I, I want you to watch this with me. It it's a powerful word. There is therefore now... No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Uh, what, what a powerful word there. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is no shame. There is no guilt. There is no penalty. I, I really like the word no in verse number 8. It's the strongest Greek word that can be applied here. It means no, never, 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 never any condemnation. No mortgage, no lien, no shame, no guilt, no penalty to those that are in Christ Jesus. God does not want you to be condemned. And God's not going to condemn those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, Saturday nights, I, I really struggle uh, with, with sleeping good. I don't know, those of you, it's just, I guess, getting up to go to church on Sunday morning or whatever it is. I don't sleep good. I had a bad dream last night. Uh, I dreamed that I died and that I went to heaven. And St. Peter met me there at the gate. And, and he said, Mike, we're glad that you're here. Uh, but before I can allow you to go in, th 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 there's a couple of things that, that you're going to need to do. And I, I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, do you see that ladder uh, that's right down there that's going up into that cloud? And I said, I sure do. And, and he said, well, at the top of that ladder, there are a lot of blackboards up there. And I want you to take this piece of chalk. And he gave me a piece of chalk about that long, and it was about that big around. And uh, he said, I want you to take that piece of chalk, climb to the top of that ladder, and I want you to go up where those blackboards are and I want you to write down every sin that you have ever committed. I said, well, best I can, I'll do that. And so I hoisted that piece of chalk over on my shoulder, went on down to the ladder and I started climbing the ladder and I got about halfway up and a shoe hit me right in the nose as I was going up. And, and so I had to go back down and lo and behold, it was Matthew Slim. And he was coming back down. And I said, well, Matthew, what, what's up, buddy? What, what, where, where are you going? He said, I'm going back after more chalk. Well, that, that's just kind of the way it is. You, you, you hear my uh, heart here. Uh, that, that board, according to Scripture, 
has been completely erased. And when I get to heaven, the slate is going to be clean. God's not going to drag up the divorce that you went through. God's not going to drag up the fact that you may have had premarital sex and the shame and the guilt of that is eating you alive. God's not going to drag up the fact that you experimented with drugs and maybe were a drug addict until God set you free. God's not going to drag up the fact that you cheated on your income taxes. Why? Because the Word of God says that we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus, that that sin has been wiped out. And when God wiped out the sin, he erases the shame of it. To God be the glory. That's good news. That's a reason to hope. And isn't that what salvation is all about? Now, Hebrews 7 says that we have a better hope for in Christ, he makes us and I love the word that he uses there. He makes us acceptable. Isn't that a great word? God makes us acceptable so that when you mess up, when you blow it, when you sin, as a believer, God doesn't get mad at you. God doesn't say, boy, you're going to pay for that one. God doesn't say, you're going to get it. That's not what being a child of God. Why? Because my sin has been paid for. My past sin, my future sins have all been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now hear me a minute. That doesn't give us a license to go out here and do whatever it is we want to do. Why? Because it cost God his son. It cost the son his life. Your forgiveness is extremely costly. But here's the deal I want to encourage you with here today and bring hope to you. When you mess up and you ask God to forgive you of your sin and yet that sin keeps haunting you and the guilt of that keeps chasing after you, you quit saying please, please, please and you start saying thank you after you have repented and trusted Christ with that forgiveness. Number two, not only... The pardon erases my shame. God's power can help me change. Look at verse 31 in that chapter, if you will, in chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What a, isn't that a good word for today? If God's for us, who could be against us? You understand that the day that you turned away from sin, placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit took up residence into your heart and your life. And you know what he said? He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So what we're reading here now is not only is God with us, God is for us. He is on your side like we've been singing all morning long. And God says, not only am I with you, I am for you and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to help you out and I will enable you to change as a result. I, you know, I've talked to hundreds of people uh, as a pastor down through the years and here's what they will say. Many, many, many of them say, my life is totally out of control. And the second thing that they'll say is, I can't do anything about it. You ever been there? Your life out of control? Powerless to do anything about it? Now, watch this with me. God never intended for you to be able to do anything about it. God didn't wire you up like that. I went back and I reread yesterday in the book of Acts when the word says, I want you to go tarry until you be endued with power from on high. And they went up into that upper room and the power of the Holy Spirit fell on those people. And they entered into a relationship with God through Christ 
empowered by the Holy Spirit that they had never experienced ever before and they now have a relationship uh, with God that enables them to have the power to change even though they don't have the power themselves to do anything about it. You see, the reason we're told until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit is that relationship that you have with him enables you to change. Let me ask you a question. If you could change anything about yourself this morning, what would you change? Some of you probably said, well, I'd probably change the way I act. Others of you would say, well, I would love to change the way that I react. But what would you change about yourself? Would you change how you respond to other people or would you change the way that you talk or would you change uh, some of the feelings that you are carrying around that you seemingly can't get rid of? And you say, well, you know what? The fact of the matter is, Pastor, I've tried many times to change and I've never been able to change and I've come to grips with maybe the fact that I will never be any different. I will never change. I'll never make a difference in this life. I'm kind of stuck. I'm kind of trapped. I feel like somehow uh, this thing in my life is just hopeless. Here, here, here's one of the things I came to tell you today. God can help you change. God will help you change. When you get to that point that you say, I've got a habit in my life that I am powerless to overcome. When you have a, a, a relationship uh, that you really don't know how to handle, how to manage, and how to navigate in your life, and you say, this relationship is hurting me, but, but I don't know how to deal with it. God says, I'll deal with your shame, and I will give you the power to change. The Word says... I will do exceedingly abundantly above everything that you could ever ask or imagine. It is beyond your wildest ability to pray about or the desires that you may have in your heart of your thoughts or of your hopes. God says, I will go way beyond anything that you can conjure up in your mind. That, that ought to bring you hope here this morning. I, I promise you, one of the beauties of being at First Baptist Indian Trail is that every week, without fail, we are seeing somebody's life changed. Every week, we see somebody that is hopeless and helpless to do anything about their plight. But they turn to God and God begins to do in them, through them, and with them what they were powerless to. To do themselves and the fact of the matter is if God did that for me and if he's doing it for these other folks he can also do that for you all right let me give you number three God's purpose transforms my problems God's purpose transforms my problems bear with me here for just a minute because these are trying times that you and I are living in. And, and, and one of the things that we really need to keep reminding of ourselves here today is that God's purpose is always greater than my problems. D did you hear what I just said? Now, when you identify what your problems are, when you identify what our nation is facing and what the world is confronted with right now, we just need to be reminded God's purpose is greater than all of that. He is sovereign God. God's plan is infinitely more significant than what we are facing. And the beautiful part of it is, ladies and gentlemen, God wants to help us. God wants to work through us. You're going to understand that life is full of problems. We're always going to have problems. But the most difficult problems that any of us will face are problems that seemingly don't make sense. When you can make sense out of your problems, then it's a whole lot easier to manage. It's a whole lot easier to deal with. But when problems don't make sense, it's very difficult. And there's probably a bunch of you that are facing stuff and junk in your life even today, and you're saying, 
You know, I don't know why I'm going through this mess. It, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. Now, now, hear my heart a minute. When you come to grips with the fact that God is greater than your problems and that God has a purpose for these problems, all of a sudden things start to make sense. And when you start making sense of those problems that God has allowed to come your way, then you're able to handle it like you have never been able to handle it before. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now I want you to circle, I want you to highlight and draw attention to the word know. For we know. He didn't say we speculate. He didn't say we think. He didn't say we hope. He didn't say we desire he says, we know. It's fully concluded at that point. And he didn't say, um, I know that everything's going to turn out the way that I hoped that it would. He didn't say that everything's going to have a happy ending. He didn't say it's all going to turn out perfect. And the reason is, is that you and I are not in heaven in that perfect place. We are right here on this nasty now and now called earth. And there's a huge difference. But he says, we know. He's talking about absolute certainty. What's he talking about? Watch it. For we know that God, you ought to highlight that word, powerful word. So understand something, every one of you here, you and I have a grand designer of our life. God, he didn't say fate. I don't believe in fate. He didn't say good luck or bad luck. No such thing at all. He didn't say happenstance or something just happened to fall into my lap. L ladies and gentlemen, don't ever forget this. God is in charge. Not this world. God's in charge. He didn't say God causes all things. It's not what he said here in the passage. But what he did say is that God causes all things to work together for good. Here, listen to this. You and I blow it. You and I make mistakes. You and I sin, but God never does. But what God does do, even when we mess up, even when we do blow it, the word says that he wraps it up with other stuff and that he brings good from it. That's his word. Now notice what God causes. God causes everything to work together for good. Notice the two words, all things. God works all things. You say, well, pastor, does that include illness? Does that include miscarriage? Does that include a flat tire? Does it include the coronavirus? Does it include bankruptcy? Does it include my mate walking out on me? Well, let me remind you. The Bible says all things. Now, that long list of things that I just mentioned, they're not good things. They are bad things. But what God says, he says, I will put them together. I'll blend them together. To bring about good, it's kind of like the ingredients. Last night, uh, I don't know, about 7 o'clock, uh, Kathy and Kaylee were going to watch this movie, and I really didn't care. It was one of these romantic kind of deals, and I, I, I wanted something to shoot them up, bang, bang. And they, they, so I just decided, you know what I'm going to do? I, I'm going to, uh, Irvin, <laughs> I got up and made a five-flavored pound cake. And, and, and first thing that I did is I, I went to the refrigerator, I went to the cabinets, and I got all of the ingredients and I set them down on the counter. Now, those ingredients in and of themselves weren't very tasteful. You're not going to find me uh, eating a raw egg. You, you're not going to watch me take a spoon and take those flavorings 
and, and drink those flavorings. I, I'm not going to do that. You, you're not going to see me put a mouthful of dry flour. I, I'm not going to take my finger and dip it down into Crisco and just put it in my mouth. In and of themselves, those ingredients weren't very tasteful. But I'm going to tell you, when I got up this morning and got my cup of coffee and I cut me a slice of that fly-flavored pound cake, oh, when they were all blended together, it was incredible. And see, that's what God is saying. That's true in life. The elements of this life are not very tasteful. They're not very good. As a matter of fact, they may be bad and that it may develop some kind of resentment and bitterness that's hard to swallow. Bad things. But God says, I'll take them for you as a believer. I'll blend them up. and We'll make something beautiful out of it and something good. Now, a lot of preachers use this illustration, and I wonder sometimes uh, if they're not stretching the truth just a little bit when they do. But I could promise you it really did happen in my life. When I was a little boy, I used to gather around my grandma Burns knee, and she was an embroiderer. And I, I distinctly remember an occasion uh, when I walked up on her and she had that ring and she had that cloth and she had her strings and her needle and, and, and there was a bluebird um, arising out of a beautiful tapestry uh, of a bluebird coming up. And I remember sitting on the floor at her lap and I looked at the bottom side of that embroidery. And there was nothing but a bunch of strings and a bunch of mess. But on the top side was a beautiful tapestry. You and I right now are going through the tapestry of life. On the top side, on heaven's side, it is embroidering a beautiful picture but us down here in this old world, we're looking from our perspective. And the fact of the matter is, from our perspective, it looks like a tangled mess. One of these days when we get to heaven, we're able to look back on this occasion. We're going to say, ah, that's what you were doing. Didn't make any sense to me when I was there, but now I see it all clearly and what a beautiful picture it really was can I say to you this morning God can bring good out of evil you think with me for a minute about the cross how ugly how evil they took their fists and they beat him beyond human recognition they took a cat of nine tails and they wrapped it around his body to the point that they exposed the bones of his ribs. They laid him down on an old cross and they drove spikes in his hands and in his feet. They thrust a crown of thorns on his already battered head. They stuck a spear in his side. Can Good come out of evil. I'm telling you, friend, on the third day, that stone was rolled away and it was empty and God had made a plan for the redemption of all of the world who would place their faith and their trust in him. God can bring good out of evil. Go back to the Gospel of Matthew. In that first chapter, you see the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts... You know, Abraham with Isaac and Isaac with Jacob and da 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 all the way down to Jesus. But did you know there were four women that were in the lineage of Jesus? There was Tamar. Tamar had a habit of marrying jerks. She married the first one. He was a jerk and he died. She married the second jerk and he died. Maybe all jerks ought to die. No, maybe they ought not to because we'd all die. But her father-in-law came and seduced her, impregnated her. But she's in the lineage of Jesus. I, I, I think about Rahab down there in Jericho who was a harlot, who was a prostitute, but <laughs> she's in the lineage of Jesus. 
I, I think about Ruth, and Ruth was not Jewish, but she illegally married a Jew and wound up in the lineage of Jesus. I think about Bathsheba. I don't have to tell you about Bathsheba. She committed adultery uh, with David and ha her husband was killed and, and, and on and on. It was just a sordid mess, but she's in the lineage of Jesus. Can God produce good out of evil? Absolutely. He takes our mistakes and he takes our sin and he blends it in with a lot of other stuff and he makes something beautiful out of it. May I say to you, not for everybody. Not for everybody. The word says for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. You may be here this morning and you may be thumbing your nose at Jesus and rejecting God's offer of salvation into your life and going on about having life your own way. I'm telling you, friend, God is under no obligation whatsoever to take the garbage and the junk and, and the despicable from your life and blend it in and make something good out of it. It is for only those who have crossed over that line and repented of their sins and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ submitted themselves and surrendered to him. It is to those people that God says, I will take the bad things. I'll take the mistakes. I'll take your uh-ohs. And I'll blend it in with some other things and make good out of it. I love what Jeremiah 29 says, and you've heard it so much, it's almost become cliche in our day, in our culture. God says, the plans that I have for you are not to hurt you. Not to harm you, but to give you hope and to bring you to an expected end. Let me hurry through these next two if I could. You understand God's provision will supply my needs. The, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. You know that the context of all of that is the basic necessities of life. And God says, put me first and you don't have to worry about anything else. You're having marriage problems? Put Jesus first. He says, I'll meet the needs of your marriage. You're having financial difficulties? Put Jesus first. He says, I'll meet your needs. He has a provision for us. The word says, since God did not even spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all, won't he also surely give us Everything else, ladies and gentlemen, listen, in, in the midst of coronaviruses, in the midst of a pandemic that has swept our world, God has already solved the biggest problem in the universe. He has solved the sin problem. And, and, and listen, when he's solved the sin problem, it's nothing for the rest of it. One more thing, God's promise will secure my future. Watch verse 38 and verse 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, this will change your life if you'll let it. God says, I will never leave you and I will never abandon you. There are a lot of times that all of us, eminently, all of us, have had a tendency and a temptation to let go of God. But God says even in the midst of that, I'll never let go of you. I brought this message for two reasons. One is to remind us that salvation is a big deal that has wonderful and powerful benefits, especially to those that have been shaken because of the events of our day. And maybe you don't have that same hope that God's people have. May I say to all of you, you don't have to go another day without Jesus. You don't have to go another day without Christ. Right in the confines of your home, 
right in your automobile where you are driving, right over that telephone that you may be watching, right in front of that computer, maybe you're watching on television, right where you are today, you can come to the place that you say, you know what, I've made a mess out of my life. I, I don't have any hope. I'm still carrying around all of this shame and this guilt that I have never been able to get rid of. And today I'm willing with all of my heart to turn away from sin. And right now I'm going to place my faith and my trust in Jesus. Today I realize that God has a plan for my life. And, and I want to see him fill that plan in me. I've followed my own plans long enough and it's brought me nothing and brought me nowhere except downhill. God's got a better plan for you. Listen, if you're not following God's plan, Satan's having his way with you. And I promise you, he's not going to make things good out of the bad of your life. He's just going to make it worse. Turn to Christ. Right where you are, would you bow with me in prayer? And let me lead you in a time of commitment with Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Turn the TV off. Turn the distractions off right now and just focus in on Christ. Would you do that with me? Would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I realize today more than ever before I've made a mess out of my life. And right now, I turn away from sin. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. With your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Hey, friend, listen. If you prayed that prayer as I prayed it and you genuinely, honestly, and sincerely meant it, God will do what he said he would do. He said, I will forgive your sin. I will save your soul. So I want to welcome you to God's family. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up the phone in a few minutes and I want you to call somebody that is so special to you in your life and I want you to tell them what you just did. Tell them you prayed that sinner's prayer and you've asked God for help and for salvation. And then I'd love for you to let us know. Maybe there's a way that you could just send us a message right over that internet. Maybe you could make a phone call to our emergency line at the church. Maybe you could just dial the church and leave, a num leave, leave your number there and we'll be glad to call you back. But would you somehow get us word today that you prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, we'd like to join you in praying for you and uplifting you and encouraging you in Christ. Welcome to God's family. Greatest decision that you've ever made. You're my brother, you're my sister in Christ. You belong now to the family of God. And here's the thing. You have hope now. And God says, I will take all of the bad garbage stakes and I'll blend them in with a lot of other things and I'll bring good out of it and receive glory. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching our broadcast. Thank you for tuning in today. I really do want to make an appeal to you, all of you. Please don't forget your offerings. We're not here to receive it right now, but make sure that you go on the website and go to giving and go through that process. You can also give on your phone through the uh, FBCIT app. It, it's very simple. Matter of fact, we've simplified that website and made it a lot easier for you. So if you would go there, uh, we still need your support. God bless you. Matthew, come on. I think you want to close this out with a little song here today, okay? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.